Good morning. There's so many kids walking out, I was going to wonder for a minute who was left. <laughs> it's great to see you all today. Before I go into the message, uh, I'd like us to take a moment to pray for someone who's been very special in our church for the last three months. His name is Samuel, and you've heard me talk about him before, and you probably have been in the room when we've prayed for him. Uh, his season here in Rochester is coming to a close. There's a, another hospital where he can go and uh, they have more advanced technology and more options available to him. It's been remarkable to watch what God is doing in his life. And uh, he's defied, not just succeeded, he's defied every expectation by the medical community. And that's not to say that they aren't rooting and cheering for him all along the way they are. Uh, I walked onto the floor yesterday where he is, and as far as I could tell, he's the only baby on that entire floor not intubated. And uh, he's just, he's doing really well. And he's going to a place where they can do amazing things. And his parents are with us this morning. I'm gonna ask you guys, are they here? There they are. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you guys just to stand for a minute. And I'm gonna ask everybody in this room who wants to participate in commanding the blessings of God and asking for his favor in this situation just to extend a hand towards them. Father, we just sang the lyrics of a song only moments ago that when we pray where there's a wall, there's now a way. We don't understand all the doors you open, but we're so grateful when they happen. And we don't think they're in accidental or incidental, but they're part of your divine plan and strategy. We know right now that Samuel is in the best hands he can possibly be in, not because of the location of the hospital, but because he's in your hands. And you're guiding and you're directing everything that is happening related to his life. We have asked you to do that and we know that you are faithful too. Will you do amazing things through the amazing people that you have gifted in this new hospital? And we also ask that you would strengthen, encourage, comfort, and give your remarkable peace to his parents. Strengthen them, uphold them, support them, and surround them with the people that can do the most good for them. And in all of this, as impossible as it may seem, Will you give them opportunity to testify of your grace? Because they're going to be in rooms with other people who are struggling too. We thank you for all of that in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed with that prayer said, amen. 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 Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, we are in Galatians, the third chapter, and uh, I want to talk a little bit today about how do you grow in your faith? How do you grow as a Christian? Because some of us think there's one way to get saved and then another way to grow. And so Paul talks about this. And his language is a little bit inflammatory, as Paul can sometimes be. And he starts out with, you foolish Galatians. How, would, how many would appreciate it if I would start out with the message this morning, you foolish congregation? <laughs> but he does. Who has bewitched you? That's, that's a really strong word. What is he saying? He's saying... Someone has said something into or over your life that has stopped you from thinking clearly. You stop thinking about something. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit, you are now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing in what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credit to him as righteousness. It's an amazing passage of scripture. Paul asks 
four questions. When someone asks a question in our culture, often it's to test to see if we know the answer. He's not inviting people to get the right answer. He's inviting people to think freshly and, and on this subject. And uh, we don't get a lot of options to think for ourselves in our culture. We're pretty much told from tiny little screens to very large ones what we're supposed to be thinking and what we're supposed to be parroting that other people tell us. But Paul wants people to think clearly about this. And so the first question he asks is, how did you receive the Spirit? How did you receive the Spirit? It's, it's amazing uh, what just what's packed into that single question. The way he asked it was, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Did you get an invitation from God to join his forever family and participate in his mission in this world because you were such a stellar example of a, of a righteous person? Your deeds were so good. He couldn't ignore you. He just had to get, I need a person like that on my team. Like you are in the first draft. You're going. Um, the central truth of Christianity, the central truth of Christianity is that Jesus Christ gave his life for us on the cross and he rose from the dead. Everything in Christianity, everything in Christianity revolves around a bloody cross and an empty tomb. Everything. We can make it so many other things, but when we start going down those roads and we start pursuing those agendas, what we discover is, is that we, we start distancing ourselves from the central work that, that God has done in our world. And the believers in Galatia, they had started their faith journey by hearing what Jesus had done and trusting. And, and Paul actually used this word. He said, did, did you not see this? Was Christ did you not see with your own eyes Christ portrayed as crucified? What was happening? They're losing perspective and a sense of proportion. The cross and Jesus is getting smaller while other things are getting larger in their life. And they're beginning to believe that what they do is actually more effective for God than what Jesus did for them. So the idea that we can receive the Spirit of God is quite remarkable in and of itself. A lot of people would really struggle with this, and understandably so. What spirit is he referring to? He's referring to the same spirit that was involved in creation. The opening verses of the pages of Scripture actually tell us that uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth when the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the waters that, that before creation actually begins that the Holy Spirit is already involved. It's that same spirit. It's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It's, it's that spirit. And what he's saying is God has given you that same spirit. That seems impossible to us or highly unlikely. Why? Because we have an assumption. God only picks very special people for something like that priests that have achieved a certain level of theological understanding, prophets who have the capacity to speak for God, kings who rule with great authority. But me, me, receive the Spirit of God. And he says, before your very eyes, which is a very interesting phrase, before your very eyes, Christ was portrayed as crucified. This is Galatia. It's a thousand miles away as the crow flies from Jerusalem. They're a long way away. They never... It would take them weeks to get there. They were not present at the crucifixion of Jesus. What is he saying? Well, we kind of use this language ourselves. Have you ever said, oh, oh, I see what you're saying now. You ever said that? But what do we mean when we say that? Well, we usually mean, oh, oh I understand. I comprehend what it is that you're saying. Uh, I, I wasn't very good in math in, in school. And I would come home and, and complain to my father that uh, my teacher was stupid. And uh, he wasn't convinced that that's where the problem was. And, uh, and he told me, he said, you just keep working at it. And, and one day the light will come on and you'll see it. And, and I'm still waiting. Um, uh, oh, I, I see what you're saying. We, we see an insight. We, we understand meaning behind something. It's, it's kind of like that. And the apostle Paul had preached them in such a way that they could see Christ crucified. And they understood what the purpose was behind that, that there was, 
there was a mission behind that. There was a motive behind that. And they could see it. it. For them, it was not just an historical fact. For them, it was moving. Look at what God has done for me. They could see that. And so a believer is not just someone who, who knows and accepts the history of Jesus. A believer is someone who, when they see the cross, they see the motive of God. They see the mission of God. And they're overwhelmed with gratitude for God because of what he has done for them. Is there any people in the house this morning that you see the cross? You understand what it means? Yeah, that's a really big deal. We see the meaning of it. It makes sense to us. Second question that the Apostle Paul asks is, how do we grow in our faith? How do we grow in our faith? The way he phrased this question was, are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? So God had given himself to us, and, and, and we received that gift. So how did you get in? How are you accepted by God to begin with? Because how you begin your faith is also the way you grow your faith. They're not separate things. And Paul is asking, are you trying to finish? Like, this is what God did for you by his spirit, and now you're trying to finish this thing in the flesh? You're trying to accomplish something on your own? You're, you're trying to complete what God has done? And we do this. We, we start out in faith and then we go, well, I need something else to complete me. Very famous movie, line out of a movie, right? You, you probably remember it. You complete me. Yeah. Jerry, <laughs> Jerry Maguire, played by Tom Cruise. And isn't everybody just completed by a fictional character and an actor? It's just amazing. What do you believe you need to complete you? Because you could well be in a situation in life right now where you feel unsatisfied and unfulfilled in some area. And our assumption is, is that God has given us this much, but in order to take the next steps or to go to the next level, there's some things that I need to do. And here's what you need to know. We cannot complete ourselves and other people can't complete us. Only God by his Holy Spirit can finish what only God by his Holy Spirit has started. That's what he's telling us. For example, you did not become a human being by pleasing your parents. Like you were not born into this world and your parents just kept looking at you. I don't know if it's a human or if it's a pet. We'll see how it turns out. That's not how you became a human being. You didn't become a human being because you got good grades in school. You were born a human being. We don't become a Christian by someone giving us a certificate or going through a certain ritual. When we live like that, we're not in touch with reality. We're not in touch with reality. We need to learn that the way we trusted God to begin this, that same process is how we keep going and growing for the rest of our lives. The third question that the Apostle Paul asks is, what is important to you? What is important to you? What is important to you? The way he says that, have you experienced so much in vain? You've experienced a lot. Was it for nothing? Uh, maybe another way to phrase that question is, what's unimportant to you? <laughs> we cannot live a sane life by giving everything equal importance. I know we're told everything has the same value. It's not true. And if you live like that, you'll go crazy. For example, let's suppose that I'm driving down the road. And as I'm driving down the road, you step into the, the, the road, and a deer steps into the road. And given my velocity, I'm not going to be able to stop in time. The only thing I can really do, in addition to applying my brakes, is steer the car. How many hope in that minute that I don't think the deer is as important as you are? Oh, I just love deer. I wouldn't want to hurt little Bambi. Have you read the book? Hmm. 
And that, I, I will tell you right now, animals are not as important as humans. Well, pastor, what a terrible thing to say. My, my pet is like a family member. Really? I'm not saying you shouldn't love your pets. I love mine. Mine's on its last legs right now and I'm having to do all kinds of things to support it. But if I had to choose between that and my spouse, it's not hard. What is important to you? What is unimportant to you? Some things are very important in life and we cannot ignore them. For example, what's more important to you? Don't actually answer, don't raise your hand, just think about it. What's actually important to you? Worshiping God or impressing others? Which do you spend more time doing? What's more important to you? Being around people who think like you? or being around people that you think God may have placed in your life. Because if all we want to be is around people like us, we will distance ourselves from people that maybe God has created divine appointments for. Or if we're around people who are different from us, what we might wind up doing is changing our values just to fit in. Do you see what happens when we don't understand what's actually important? And the gospel, the gospel reminds us what's actually important. And if we can't tell what is important, we will be at the mercy of every temptation that comes to our life. We'll just, we'll do anything for or with anyone. And the gospel tells us that's no way to live. Knowing what's important actually is what gives us a sense of direction and a sense and purpose in life. And this is what the gospel does. Fourth question. What do you trust? What do you trust? This is how God answers, or this is how Paul asks this question. Does God give you his spirit? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing in what you heard? The, the word gives, that word just in the English language just doesn't portray as much as we would like it to, it, as, as much as the original word means, it, it has to do with this, uh, this idea of lavishness, unbelievable, untold generosity. Um, if, if you remember the story of the prodigal son, uh, the, the son goes out and he lives lavishly. He just spends everything wildly. And Paul uses that same concept here to say, it's God who lavishly, just unbelievably gives that, that's who God is. And he, what does he give? He gives you his spirit. And so this is God just not being stingy, but being very generous with his spirit. Why does this, ma this matter? Because the way you think about God affects the way that you live. For example, if we see God as angry, and there's lots of people who do, some of you in this room right now, and some that are watching online. You see God as angry, then you're going to live in a constant state of fear and anxiety. That you somehow stepped over some line. Your toe hit some invisible border. You made a mistake. I, I did this with my son one time. He was saying something to me I didn't like very much. And I said, what's on the floor behind you? And he said, what? I said, the line you just crossed. Did you feel it when you went over that thing? Or... Are you still oblivious to that? We live in this kind of fear that, that somehow we have crossed a line and now God is angry with us. And, and that's, that's not how God is. If we see God as stingy, we will constantly go around feeling like we're being gypped. We're not getting what we deserve. There's people who live their whole lives like that. If we feel that God is impersonal, then by and large, we'll live aimlessly. We'll just kind of wander, going through the motions in life, wondering what could happen next and if it matters at all. The gospel puts us back in touch with reality. The gospel puts us back in touch with reality. And when I say reality, I mean all of it. 
It puts us back in touch with God. It puts us back in touch with what he has created. He's created the world. He puts us in touch with the world that he's created. He's created people. He puts us in touch with people that he's created. Now for us, there's a lot of people we would rather not have anything to do with. Mostly those who are different at all from us. There are some people who, who uh, well, how many have ever heard this? That, uh, that we're attracted in marriage, people are attracted to someone very different from them. You ever heard that? It's true. And, and then once they get married, they think the other person should be like them. I heard this line yesterday, I thought it was funny, I was at a marriage conference and, and, and this was the line, marriage is nature's way to keep us from fighting with strangers. <laughs> it's kind of like that. He puts us in touch with the people that he's created and Christ has redeemed and he loves, he puts us in touch with the mission and the motive of God and, and, and feelings of hope and despair with all of our feelings. Some people think that if you come to God, you're only going to be in touch with your faith feelings and with your happy feelings and with your joyful feelings and with your confident feelings and, and that that's what faith really is. And then you don't have to deal with any of the negative emotions. God does not ask us to pretend anything. Pretend is not what makes us free. Truth is what makes us free. And God calls us to be in touch with every emotion in our life and with our doubt as well as our faith and with the invisible as well as the visible. And I know there's lots of materialists in the world to say, nope, if I don't see it, I don't believe it. That's not true. You have never seen the wind but you believe it. If you go out onto a lake or on the ocean and you have a sailboat, you can't see the wind, but if you set your sails, you can be moved by it. And there are all kinds of people say, oh, if I, don't, if I don't see it, I don't believe it. You've never seen electricity, but you turn the switch on when you walk in the room. If you were in the ocean, you would set the sail. You would not just sit out there and go, I'm not moving, but I'm not setting a sail because I've never seen the wind. There's an invisible realm and it's spiritual and I can't prove it to you, but I can show you the effects of it. And trusting in God is the way we set the sail. And when you set the sail, all of a sudden you find yourself being propelled through life with a force that's very different than your own imagination or other people's manipulations. How many think that's a really good idea, right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll ask the worship team to come out. So how does the gospel affect the way we live? It keeps us from returning to this self-work mentality. It'd be so easy, so easy, that when we want God to heal a precious little baby, that we start paying attention to the rules more than to the God who's more generous than we are perfect. There are some people who say, well, does that mean I can do whatever I want? And that's, no, but not for the reason that you're thinking. When we address areas of our life in the same way we came into faith, we actually grow in our faith. The way we grow is to take those things that are causing us to stumble and frustrate us and fail and and be afraid, we take those things, and, and what do we do? Do we tell ourselves, well, you, you just need to try harder. You just need to read more of the Bible. That'll do. You just need to, and then we, whatever, and it always winds up being something that we do. And we get so frustrated. There must be, there must be something I can do to make these other things go away. And, and Paul tells us, It's not how you received the Spirit of God to begin with. It's not how you were welcomed into his family to begin with. What makes you think that your faith is going to increase or your situation in life is going to change because of how clever or how good you are? Take the issue that's causing you to be afraid or angry, anxious, 
annoyed, whatever it is, and start looking at it through the cross of Jesus. See, what happens is we develop these kind of what, what I would call functional saviors. If I have this, then my life will be worth something. And so an, an example would be uh, if, if you're feeling angry, why are you angry? You ever ask yourself that? I just am. Oh, well, yes. But anger is actually a secondary emotion. Even psychologists will tell you that. You're always angry because of something else. What is it that you feel like you need that you're not getting? Who do you feel is withholding that from you? Why do you assume that if you got what you wanted from that person, your life would be better, complete? And then rather than trying harder, because people do this, all right, I'm not going to be angry. 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 Shut up. I'm not going to be angry. I'll count to 10. One, two, three, four, five, ten. There. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be angry. You, you, can't, you can't win that way. You can't get ahead that way. What can you do? You can say, Father, what I see is there's something that I'm not getting that I want or I'm having to deal with that I don't think I should have to deal with. And what I recognize is I'm looking for that to be my savior in life. And instead of that, I'm turning to you and the cross and what you've done for me. And the spirit of God begins to flow into your life and he becomes your savior. If comfort is a functional savior, if comfort is a functional savior, we just like to be comfortable, then anything that makes you uncomfortable is going to make you annoyed. It's going to be frustrating to you. So why should I assume that I should never have a moment of discomfort in my life? Anything that makes it hard for me, why? I, I will just be annoyed, I'll be frustrated, I'll be angry, I'll be fearful. What, whatever it is that's taking away my comfort. And it's a functional savior. If I was comfortable, and what do we do? We'll work like crazy to make the money that we want that will make us. No, not generous comfortable. It's a functional savior or approval. If approval is your functional savior, then anyone who doesn't accept you or doesn't support you will drive you to insanity. Comfort, approval, control. These are not issues we can try harder in. They are issues we can repent of. Look to the cross. Abraham ends this way, or I'm sorry, Paul ends this way. He said, Abraham believes God. I love that phrase. It was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God. Do you know what it didn't say? Abraham believed in God. Uh, you can believe in God without believing God. But you cannot believe God without believing in God. I know that sounded, didn't sound deep, did it? It sounded confusing. <laughs> um, Abraham didn't just believe in God. Some of you today, you believe in God. You believe in Jesus, that he came. You believe he died on the cross. You believe in him. The question is, do you believe him? Do you believe what he's speaking and accomplishing in your life? Are you willing to trust him? And this is the most amazing part of all of it, is that when we not just believe in God, but we believe God, this is what it said about Abraham. That belief, that believing God, God said, I can convert that to righteousness because our trust is in him, not in ourselves. Would you bow your head? Father, thank you. Our temptation is to try to do everything on our own. And even without deliberately intending it, we wind up taking credit for things that you have done. Would you help us today 
understand freshly that the way we grow our faith is the way we came into our faith. It is not something that we have done or we deserved. It is your mission, it is your motive, and that affects every area of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.